Welcome to the Hockey Podcast. I am Luke Lipinski. And I'm Doug Cannon. On this week's episode, we look at the biggest trades of the summer with an eye towards training camp next month. It's been a long time since we sat in these chairs, Luke. But never fear, THP fans. Your Hockey 411 is back. Wow. All that and quite possibly more. Let's drop the puck on episode 57. We are back. The Hockey Podcast. That's the name of the show, right? I didn't change it, did you? <laughs> that seems like a pretty basic name. Luke Lipinski alongside Doug Cannon for episode 57. Yes, I did have to look up which episode it was. That's how long it's been, Doug. But you know what? Hockey season is not too far away. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's too far away. Well, yeah. I mean, if it's not today, it's too far away. But, you know, you know. luckily the two of us are so entrenched in the world of hockey that you're still playing and I'm still coaching so at least we're on the ice. That's true, which given where we record the show from, it's not a bad idea to spend the summers indoors on a sheet of ice. Yeah, especially uh, where we are, and anybody that's listened to the show before knows that uh, we record the show in Phoenix, Arizona. It was 117 the other day. It was a brisk 117 outside. Yeah, and humid. It was like 18%. Today, though, <laughs> d- 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 <laughs> yeah, that's not good. Today... um it has cooled off to about, what is it, 111? That's yeah, it was 111 there. about 10 minutes ago. I could almost feel my face as I walked indoors, like it hadn't completely just melted all the feeling away. So here we are. Okay, and, before you go further, though, what do you think of people that live here and they go, but it's a dry heat? Well, I don't like those people very much, Doug, because those are the people that lied and got me to move here in the first place. Yeah, you know, when you tell me it's a dry heat. How is that better? Hot is hot. I don't care what you say. The inside of an oven is a dry heat. I mean, I could live in Boston and climb into an oven and be like, hey, I'm in Phoenix. Yay. Yay. And that's what it feels like. You know what, though? I've, I've noticed this. It, it, August, Middle of August right now, anybody that's in Phoenix right now, anybody you see on the streets, anybody you get stuck behind because they don't know how to look Well, it looks like a, a zombie apocalypse out of my front window because there's nobody there's on nobody the streets. There's nobody here, yeah. Well, <laughs> this is also the middle of the day. Anybody that's here right now lives here. Nobody's visiting Phoenix in the middle of August from out of This is true. But you know what I do tell people when we have these extreme heat waves in our area is every month. I don't have to shovel heat. <laughs> That's a good point. I was at the I was in the motherland this summer. I went back and it was beautiful. Seventy eight degrees, sitting in my father's backyard having a cup of coffee, watching the wildlife bounce bounce around in the trees, blue jays flying in, squirrels. It was it was wonderful. Just to be clear for the listeners that maybe don't know where we're from, the motherland is Russia for you or where No, is the it? motherland for me is Toronto. Oh, was that explain why you're wearing a Toronto hat and a shirt that says, and I quote, I am Canadian? <laughs> It's, well, that's the brand of beer I drink. A lot of Canadian pride in here. For the record, I'm from and, the United States but, of America. But you must clarify, it's a Toronto FC cap. I just assumed the FC stood for expletives aimed at the Toronto Maple No, Lakes. that's the football club. Oh, okay. Football, the football meaning club? soccer. That's not confusing at all to my American mind. So, yeah, but you got to go back there, and it's nice and cool. And Yeah, and I, was like, I was loving it, except that I realized that in three months they're – going to be very cold up there shoveling snow. and i won't be you won't be shoveling heat then it'll no, be perfect it'll be perfect so anyway drove over here to your palatial studio i gotta say the second i walked in the front door and even just driving over here it feels like hockey there's something about this place that just oozes i might be the fact that there's hockey stuff everywhere <laughs> yeah, there's hockey memorabilia sticks behind you <laughs> yeah now that i look at it there's like an autographed photo of wayne gretzky and yeah there's about 10 maybe that's why i feel like i'm in a hockey shop right now but uh training camp is in a month. It's around the corner. And we have we have a lot to catch up on because it's been the off season. We haven't really done an off season show. Well, let's catch up on you, Luke. What have you been doing? How's your team doing? Well before we hit the NHL. Before we hit the pros. Let's stay at the amateur level. Oh, how's, you how's your team play, doing? Because I know you play hockey and uh I used to play hockey. I just don't have time because I coach so much. Now. Because you're coaching hockey. Yes. <laughs> You've cut into your hockey time with more hockey. Hockey's my, my hockey team's doing well, winning a lot of games. I believe we've lost twice all year. I have three boys. I play, play now. I got two midgets, an 18, 16, and a 14. Ban them. And um, we have a local store here, BTM, behind the mask, that sells hockey equipment. All three of my boys needed new gear this year. That's not uh, expensive at all, I'm sure. You know that, you know that, uh, that saying, sticker shock when you buy a new car? Yeah. Uh, I fainted. <laughs> three times? <laughs> 
And the guy in the shop's going, "Are you okay, coach?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm, 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 uh, yeah, I'm okay." How much was that again? <laughs> the guy in the shop is saying, "Are you okay, coach?" As he rifles through your wallet and is like, "You don't have anything left in here. You have another wallet." <laughs> Yeah, where's your wife's purse? Yeah, I can't give you all this equipment for just six thousand dollars. So that's where my time is. My time is. Um, I like that store, by the way. I've been there quite frequently. Oh, they they treat the hockey players in Arizona fabulously. They treat young hockey players that are just starting. They do equipment drives for these young kids. I mean, they just do a great job. Um, and then. Our season started. We're practicing already. The boys are already practicing. Their season's already started. We got games in September, and here we go. Yeah, it feels good. It feels real good. It's oh, and I get to pat myself on the back. Well, you do that every show, so why well, not? Why not this show? Yeah, I'm in the Hall of Fame. Wow, well, <laughs> I'm a Hall of Famer. You started done, your own Hall of Fame. You're doing a podcast with a Hall of Famer. If you had told me that, I could have introduced you as Hall of Famer Doug Cannon. I am a Hall of Famer now. Competitive eating or what where where are you what Hall of Fame? My sons play for an association called Mission Arizona. Okay. Uh they've been in the valley for ten years. Uh great success with their players going on to juniors and other clubs. And they have a Hall of Fame. And every year before the start of each season, boys that have gone to a higher level not not every boy, but players that have made it are inducted into that association's Hall of Fame. Okay. I made the Hall of Fame as a coach. Oh, this is this is going to be tough to work with. At this <laughs> so you're working with a Hall of Famer, oh, Luke? I don't like the, how the dynamic just switched right before my very eyes. And I was ambushed on the air with this news, too. Oh, but it was good. So now it's Hall of Famer Doug Cannon. No, no, I'm just saying. Luke I had, Lipinski. <laughs> it's a great honor. It is. That's that's cool. I, that's mean, actually I really love cool. being around these these kids. I love coaching. And then for the association to recognize me, it was just a huge honor. And I just give a shout out to Mission Arizona because they do a great job with the kids here. That was that's that is actually very cool. All all joking and all that aside, I will congratulate you. Although that will be the only time on this air I ever congratulate you. Okay. So so training camp starts in about a month for NHL month. teams. Yep. Um, I actually have one piece of news we should well we'll, we'll get to it in news and notes I suppose, but with the local angle. Mm-hmm. Austin Matthews probably be the number one pick next year. It sounds like now is finally playing. Yes, in was Europe. That, was that the angle you were taking? Yeah, I was just going to throw it out there just as a quick note, just because we were talking so much locally, and there's who knows how many people that are listening to this actually live in Phoenix. But you're talking about a place where you're going and spending all your money. That's the same place Austin Matthews probably spent all his parents' money growing Absolutely. up. Absolutely, he he skated in uh, another part of the valley called Scottsdale, and uh, it was funny. Going back, we flew in from Toronto, and on that flight was Austin Matthews and his dad. There you go. And um, proving my point that there's always hockey players flying into or out of Toronto. But it was cool because my son's about the same age as Austin. Um, and he goes, hey, Dad, there's Austin. I said, oh, yeah, there he is. And, and my son has played against Austin. Uh, I just think it's great that they finally got all of the visa, visa stuff straightened out, and he gets to play because, I mean, what a great opportunity before his draft. Yeah. That Basically, we've got a year of hearing about him. He's going to be playing with men. He's pretty good. You've seen him play? Yeah. 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 Decent? He's very, very good. You know what he's not that you are, though? A Hall of Famer. <laughs> you should have held that yeah, over his head. I, yeah, I should have, but he's a good kid. Uh, October 7th is when the NHL season begins. And what's the first game, Luke? Well, I was... <laughs> Based on the way you just said that, I'm sure it involves Toronto and something even oh, and more where's Canadian. It, where's it played, Luke? Montreal. Are they playing no, Montreal? No. Oh, it's in Toronto? It's in Toronto. All right. The, probably the last meaningful game they'll play in Toronto this season, <laughs> so you may as well enjoy it. Yeah, Montreal, Toronto kick off the season. Less than two months away. So there are one, two, three, four games on October 7th. Uh, Montreal's in Toronto, Rangers, Chicago. That's a good way to kick off the season. Yeah, it's basically a... Vancouver, Calgary. I'm really happy. I'm I'm really waiting to see what Calgary does this year. I'm impressed with what Calgary has done this offseason. We'll get more into it when we do the division previews that we always do, but I thought they were going to have a drop-off this year, and their offseason has been one of the best of anybody's. Yeah, they've done an incredible... San Jose and Los Angeles. I feel like you're pronouncing one of those wrong. I won't won't venture to guess which one. Sharks, Kings. (laughs) Same game, different name. It's um, it's it's close. It's not that far away, and we haven't gotten into the the big moves of the off season, so we're going to do that on this show. We'll touch 
briefly, we're going to touch on probably the five or six biggest trades and sort of the impact they're going to have on teams going forward this season. We've got some news and notes at the end of the show, but wanted to get your thoughts real quickly, too, on the on the draft. We haven't done a show since the draft. The top two picks, everybody knew it was going to be Connor McDavid and mm-hmm. it was going to be Jack Eichel, and it was. Uh, I have some thoughts on the Oilers we'll get to later on. I th- well, I'll just save them. But uh, anybody else in the draft really stand out to you? It was, it was kind of an, a, a different sort of draft because it was loaded with talent compared to most years, but also... It didn't really start till the third pick because we knew the first two picks for a year mm-hmm. leading up to it. Right. Uh, not because we're in Phoenix, but I really thought the third pick was fantastic. It was basically I, the first pick this year. Right. I, I thought that uh, Don Maloney and his staff held their guns and, and made the right move. I agree. Uh, so I was really, really, really happy, not only because I live here, but because I thought that you know it was the, the best move at that position. The other one was the 14th pick. And the 14th pick I have a personal attachment to uh, because uh, I used to work with Louis DeBrusque and his son Jake was selected 14th. And of course, I was watching Jake during the draft because I have that personal connection to, to the family. And he was projected to go like 30th, like between 25, 30. Yeah, still you know, a first rounder. Range. but yeah. Still a first rounder, but he was supposed to go way lower. And I was, I felt just, just so elated for Louis and so happy for Jake. And then days, I mean, days after he selected and he's at the prospect camp, yeah, he's got a video going viral that, from this huge goal that he made uh, in one of the practices. And so uh, it was a good draft for me. I, I just, I enjoyed the draft. I enjoyed where the Coyotes picked. Um, I didn't see anything that really jumped out at me. There wasn't any, I mean, the craziest parts of the draft were Boston picking 13th, 14th, and 15th. Because of the deal they made. Yeah, which we're going to get into in the next segment. And, you know, the, the very the very bottom of the first round, again, I mean, maybe this is a little bit of a, an Arizona bias, but I was stunned to see the Coyotes get Nick Merkley at 30 when a lot of scouting services had him at 13. Right. So they were able to get him there, also getting Dylan Strom at 3. The very top of it, uh, Toronto gets Mitch Marner, who... I know Toronto wanted. I mean, you have to be pretty excited about that, wearing your, your Maple Leafs hat for a second. You got to be excited about a playmaker like Mitch Marner. He doesn't have anybody to pass to, but he's there. And he played for London. There you go. So he's Where I was born. Connected. <laughs> I feel like this is the Doug show today. And uh, Noah Hannafin slides to Carolina at five, which I understand. Obviously, the first two teams weren't going to take him. The Coyotes don't really what need him. What does that remind defenseman. you of, that drop? Another defense, Seth Jones. Yeah, this couple kind of had that yeah. Seth Jones feel to it. It's it like did. he's going third, he's going third, he's going third, he's going. Boom, boom. All of a sudden, he's fifth. <laughs> right. Which, you know, I mean, that's not a big drop. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but I mean, when somebody's touted like that, and then all of a sudden there's like, wait a minute. Yeah, it's what's not, going on? It's not a big drop necessarily from his perspective, but if you're Carolina and you're sitting there at five and you needed a, a young defenseman and you got one. Got to be pretty happy. That worked out pretty well for them. Those are the main things from from the draft. I, I think that the Oilers kind of changed direction the second they won the draft lottery, knowing they were going to get McDavid, and all of a sudden started doing a lot of things better that I like a lot more. Because if you just bring in McDavid, maybe that's enough to get you into the playoffs, but they've done a lot of other things too. That that might be a team that contends for a playoff spot this year. Or look, maybe they'll just miss and they'll end up drafting Austin Matthews next year. Who knows? Because we know they're getting the first pick if they miss the playoffs. That's been established. Well, and then, but, you know, well, I guess that thought's not silly. Yeah, it is silly, so I'm not going to use it. This is the new Doug Cannon that filters himself? Yeah, I'm filtering myself here. <laughs> it's the whole new era of you Hall like of that? Fame Doug. You like that, folks? That was pretty good, wasn't it? I'm going to call you Hall of Fame Doug now. From no, here on come over, on. So. going to call me the Hoff? Yes. No, that name's reserved for the one and only David Hasselhoff. You're tuned in to The Hockey Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Hockey Podcast for even more hockey news. Hashtag do it. All right, segment two here of The Hockey Podcast. Doug, it's been a while, and it's we've documented very well the how hot it is out here. Um, I may have may, – might be suffering a little bit of the, the heat – He'd struggle. Yeah. I, I forgot to do the number game in the first segment, which I know is, is I didn't miss it. That's what you live for. I didn't miss it. You play it off it's like a silly you don't game. care, but it's it's probably your highlight of the week. I'll just be honest. The numbers game's a silly game. So number 57, as this is episode 57, and it's getting tougher to find 
uh, no, best, it's not the best player in the position. <laughs> Some of these numbers, yeah, it is. No, come on. 57 is a great number. All right, well, I have my clear answer and my only answer. Tyler Myers. That's not my only answer. Defenseman, Buffalo, now with Winnipeg. I understand who Tyler Myers is, but that's okay. not my answer. George Peros. Ooh, Harvard grad, right? Harvard? I Harvard think so, or yeah. Yale? Okay. Yeah. Now, to be transparent here, he only wore 57 with the Kings in Colorado. All right. Uh, I'll let it slide when this he was one with, time. When he was with Anaheim, he was 16, Florida 22, and Montreal 15. But at least he wore it. So you can use him uh, like five different I times. I like George Peros. You know, he's a big teddy bear with that mustache. But the uh, one we both agree upon is David Perron. Princeton, not uh, Harvard or well, Yale. But yes, David Perron. He's got to be it. So the question to you, Mr. Penguin. All right. Why was he wearing 39 last year? Because Marcel Gotch was there already wearing 57. And before you make the joke, he wasn't like, ah, gotcha. Gotcha. (laughs) I knew where you were going, so I just figured I would just kill the joke before you did. So. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't seniority have anything to play? I know he was on the team before Perron, but he he was a vet. Well, you don't just come and take somebody's number. Yes, you do. Well, David Perron doesn't. Or you do what the NFL does. Players in the NFL do. You write a check. Hey, I don't think anybody's paying a check for 57. That's just not. But he's worn it since day one. He's wearing it again this year, coming up. Oh, but he had to take a pause. Yeah, and look how that affected the Penguins. It did not work out well for them at all. So here we go. Okay. Let's start with the Penguins, and let's start with the Maple Leafs. We're going through some of the biggest uh. trades of this offseason, and uh, let's just start at the top. I mean, I don't think there was a bigger deal that took place this offseason than the Phil Kessel deal. Phil Kessel goes to Pittsburgh. Uh, I won't read through all the the pieces. I mean, Pittsburgh gets Tim Erickson, some picks, another prospect. Toronto gets Nick Spalling. There you go. You can have him. Hopefully he helps you win the cup this year, Doug. Uh, Kasperi Kapanen one of Pittsburgh's top prospects. Scott Harrington, one of their top defensive prospects. Your thoughts on this trade from a Toronto perspective because you're giving up a guy that has scored 40 goals in this league a few times. Well, I've said it many times on the show. A hockey team is only good as its locker room. Phil Kessel had the numbers. I mean, it wasn't like he didn't perform, but apparently there was some kind of rift in the room. Yeah, and I don't even know if it was Phil Kessel's fault, but it just seems like that organization needs to kind of start over from scratch. Since the day last season that they let... Carlisle go. They just never found themselves again. How do you feel about the Babcock signing? Because we really haven't talked about that on the show either. It's a lot of money. I don't <laughs> that's, know. They, that's accurate. I was just like, the big joke was, okay, they've given $50 million to uh, Mike Babcock, but can they buy or can they hire anybody else? Do they have any money left? I think they do. I think the, the Maple Leafs are doing okay for themselves financially. Uh, yeah, I think they have the cash. It was just a joke. We don't do jokes on this show, Doug. It's all very serious. What do I think? Well, because I think the the better addition to that What I think joke... is that um, Mike Babcock is highly respected in the hockey world. Um, the easy statement for me to make from an outsider and just a hockey fan is it's great when you've got a stable of horses to make the playoffs, but when you don't have those thoroughbreds, let's see what happens. Yeah, this is the ultimate test. I mean, he goes from Detroit and coached in Anaheim when they had a lot of talent. He goes to Toronto, and they just they traded their best player away. And I get why they did it, although I will tell you from a Pittsburgh perspective on this trade, I'm surprised that the Penguins only had to basically give up Kapanen and Harrington, both very good prospects. I thought Toronto was going to hold out for more, although it sounds as weird as it as it seems. It almost sounds like the market wasn't necessarily there for Toronto to make that trade. It's not like Pittsburgh got caught in a bidding war with anybody else. It was kind of Pittsburgh realized it's either us or you keep Phil Kessel, so here's our offer, take it or leave it. And I think in, under normal circumstances, you just wouldn't trade Phil Kessel, except Toronto feels the need to start over, and I get why. So that's the deal they got. I mean, Shanahan, they got players. Shanahan was clear that he was going to clean house and he was going to start from a baseline of zero and work his way up. And Phil Kessel leaving was part of that. And he, you know, he held his cards very tight 
until it came out. I mean, I don't think anybody saw it coming, nor did anybody see the fact that it was going to be Pittsburgh that they did the deal with. He's a talented winger. I don't care what anybody says and all the all the doughboy jokes about Phil Kessel, but he's a heck of a player and he's fun to watch. And I think Pittsburgh fans are going to see that. You're going to have a strong winger that can score. I think Pittsburgh is, you know my constant pessimism about the Penguins. I think they've done... About as well for themselves this offseason as they could. That doesn't guarantee a Stanley Cup or anything. And they're kind of at the point where if they don't win the Cup, it's going to be – it's each year it's going to be a disappointment. But you got – you bring in Phil Kessel. You don't lose anybody off your roster that you were using last year. Okay, so, so I got uh, – ah, off the top of my head, I got Kunitz on the left. I got Benino at center, and I got Kessel on the right. Not a bad line. No. And, I mean, the problem with Pittsburgh every year is the injuries – but at this exact moment, they're all healthy. So if they're all healthy, you have some... Oh, but... That doesn't sound healthy. The Penguins made a big revelation this offseason. Yeah. They've hired a special strength and conditioning coach so that you won't have any more injuries. I feel like if that works, they should have done it a few years ago. And if it doesn't work, then we're right back where we started. But your top nine in Pittsburgh, let's just assume Pascal Dupuis is able to come back. In some combination, you've got Kunitz, Crosby, Kessel, Malkin, Hornquist, David Perron, Nick Benino, or Eric Fair, and that's, Dupuis. That's fair. That's. <laughs> well, I walked right into that. That's a pretty solid top nine. You can fill out a fourth line with whoever you want. Right. The defense, it's going to come down to, to depth again, but that's the most depth the Penguins have had up front since 2009. Yeah. Rounding out an oxygen line usually isn't that hard at the NHL level. <laughs> That's true. Yet yeah, that was Pittsburgh's focus when Rutherford came in last year. That's who cares about the top two lines. We need to really make that fourth line stronger. And look where that got them. All right. So there's a couple other trades I really want to hit on. Dougie Hamilton goes from Boston to Calgary. I maintain if the the Kessel trade doesn't happen, this is the trade that's the the headline of of the entire off season. And it speaks to our earlier point. Calgary had a really nice year last year. It was a great story. My thought, at least. I remember having this conversation at the NHL Awards show back in June with people. It was a nice story. They're going to be the team that regresses this uh, this upcoming season because they were a little ahead of schedule. And instead, they've made some really good moves, and they get Dougie Hamilton from the Bruins for a first-round pick and two second-round picks. And you need those picks, obviously, but you bring in a young Dougie Hamilton who could be an anchor of a defense – that already has Mark Giordano and TJ Brody as well. And That's Johnny a good Go defense. Drogo. Well, yeah, up front they're low. And then you've got Jonas Hiller and um, Kari Ramo did a decent job last year. Thought he was solid, yeah. Uh, before we started recording, I even said to you that I thought Calgary's big plus was between the pipes. And with a lot of young kids that can score, that's what you need. You need some solid blue line and some solid goaltending to settle things down in the defensive end until you can get the whole team playing a, a team defense with the, those kids that can score. You know, Sean Monahan as well. I mean, Matt Stajan. This team's pretty good on paper. It, it, they add Michael Froelich too in the offseason. It's, it's, Yuri Hoodler just came off a 76-point Lady Bing season. You know, I, I really, I do think last year was, was them kind of gelling and, and coming together faster than anybody expected. But I think they looked around, Brad Tree living in that front office looked around and said, well, this is where we are. Let's go out and add Dougie Hamilton and, and a couple other pieces in the offseason. All of a sudden, yeah, they they should make the playoffs. They should make a push for the playoffs again this season. They're definitely playing for the playoffs. I now. don't see this team dropping off. I don't. I really don't. Especially a team that has a defenseman for a captain. This team is not going to drop off. Yeah, I mean, that, that top four of Giordano, Hamilton, Weidman, and Brody on defense, that's that's pretty enviable to, to almost any team in the league. So let's put this team beside Edmonton. Okay. What Calgary has going into this season that Edmonton doesn't have, because I think they're both loaded up front with really young, talented players, is now Calgary has playoff experience. And they won a series, too. They didn't just get to the playoffs. They won a series. So they got some playoff experience, which I think gives that team that little extra maturity that Edmonton doesn't have yet. And that confidence, knowing that they can do it. Yeah. I, I look at I look at these two teams, and I think Calgary is obviously a, 
ahead of Edmonton in the uh, the the rebuild process. I mean, it, Calgary's not even really rebuilding anymore. You made the playoffs. You made the second round last right. year. They're just tweaking right now. Yeah, that's that's a in good a positive team. way. That's, <laughs> thank you for clarifying that. I, I feel like they are are ahead of Edmonton, but I do feel like the Oilers' ceiling is still higher. I mean, when when you rattle off some of those names of guys up front that. They've all kind of been the butt of jokes over the last couple of years because they have all that talent and can't win. But they they didn't get rid of any of those guys. So they still have Hall and they still have Everly and Nugent Hopkins and Yakupov. And then you add Connor McDavid in and you add a goaltender, which is the next trade on this list. Uh, Edmonton gets Cam Talbot from the New York Rangers. Cam Talbot in a seventh round pick for a second, a third, and a seventh. Which is a huge pickup for that team. It, that's what they had to have. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's not bigger than McDavid, but it makes McDavid that much more valuable because now you can keep the puck out of your own net. And don't forget, they made changes in the front office too. So there's different different people calling shots in Edmonton now. So I think you're going to see a different approach than you have in the past. There's been questions with Talbot. I mean, I, I get why the Rangers had to trade him because they weren't going to be able to keep him and they have Henrik Lundqvist, so we may as well get something for him. He's only started 53 NHL games, and they were all behind that Rangers defense, which he's not going to have in Edmonton. But his numbers are pretty surreal in those 53 games. A 2.00 goals against average and a 931 save percentage with eight shutouts. I mean, if you can... You figure he probably... They would like him to start about 60, 65 games this year in Edmonton. Yep. So those numbers, I mean, I'm, I don't expect him to keep those numbers up over the course of a season. Again, not playing behind the Rangers' defense. But, boy, if he gets anywhere near those numbers, Edmonton's a playoff team. I don't know if they're going to be a playoff team. But if he gets near those numbers, they are. You think? If he's holding teams to two, two point one, two point two goals per game, yeah, they're going to score more than that. I don't think, if you press me right now and said, are the Oilers a playoff team this year? Let me clarify. I don't think they are. But I think they're close. And if Talbot just does what he's done for the first two years of his career for a full season in Edmonton, that's obviously the great equalizer. Mm. I don't know if it's an equalizer. Well, what word would you use, Doug? I think that they're going to be a much improved team. All right. I don't think we're going to see the last placed Edmonton Oilers anymore. I don't think they're going to get Austin Matthews next draft. Oh, I think they'll still figure out a way to do that. No, that's just not going to happen. They could win the cup and win the lottery. Yeah, it's kind of been the trend. It's No matter what they do, they win the lottery. As soon as I see Bill Daly grin, I'm going, oh, Oilers get the old gold card again. Yeah. But, uh, no, I see what you're saying about his numbers. But being a number one goalie is a whole different ball game. Oh, I agree. I don't think he can duplicate those numbers. But if he somehow got near them again, that's that's what Edmonton needs. When you consider the the infusion of talent you're already getting with Connor McDavid and Andre Sakara on defense, we'll see. Edmonton's going to be a story that you're going to hear a lot about this year, certainly, and, and we'll keep a close eye on them. A couple other trades I want to run through real quick. Milan Lucic goes from Boston to Los Angeles. The Bruins, the moves they've made this offseason, I could see them regressing and taking a step back and maybe maybe missing the playoffs in the East just because of, of the caliber of the other top teams in the East. But they send Lucic to uh, to L.A. for first-round pick, Martin Jones, Colin Miller. They end up trading Jones. So, I mean, that's a huge pickup for L.A. Yeah, but I'm still I'm still mulling over the Oilers stuff. Oh, okay. I well, need to go back. All right. That was my greatest intro ever. I'm sorry. That's fine. We'll just edit it out in post production. Because the Oilers didn't score last year. Yeah, that is weird. With that talent, you would think they would have scored a lot more than they. That's kind of like not sitting well with me. Well, what what is your argument? That there's no way they make the playoffs, or even if they got good goaltending, it wouldn't be enough? Well, relying on Talbot to get a two-point-something average is not unattainable. But the team only scored two-point-something goals a game. So, well, I guess you could make the playoffs if you tied every game. That's 82 points. (laughs) Wouldn't make it in the West, but yeah, I see what you're saying. But, I mean... It is. It, you look at the, the Edmonton Oilers, they scored 198 goals last year. And you start to look around the league, and there's four teams that scored less. 
That lineup we just read off is pretty insane. If you take McDavid off of it, it's not nearly as good. But it should still be scoring more than just the 190 goals it scored last year. I'll throw a quick comparison because Tampa Bay used to be the team that could score six, seven goals a game, and that's how they won their games. Yeah. But the other team was always scoring five or six goals too. They changed that factor, and it was goaltending that changed that factor. They were still scoring five, six goals a game, but they were only letting in two goals a game. So do you think Talbot's their guy, or is, is this going to be an issue? That's a lot of weight. That's a lot of weight for one guy. The young guys, maybe the infusion of Connor McDavid will help those other guys get their act together and start finding the back of the net. Well, I don't want to say it's a short leash, but Talbot's only signed for one more year. So if he comes in and he's just a disaster this year for the Oilers, well, he's got a lot of motivation to, to perform if he's only got a one-year well, deal. He's only making $1.45 million too. Yeah. I mean, this is as much of a, a proving ground for him this year as anybody else on the Oilers. Okay, sorry to drag us back, folks, but it was a point bouncing between it, my ears that fun. I wanted to touch on. It's it's tough to make your next point when that previous point is. And I haven't done this for a while, so so you're out of practice. I'm out of practice. So real quick, 10 seconds, Milan Lucic to LA. Anything anything uh anything big there other than Lucic who himself is quite large? I'm tired of LA getting what they want. <laughs> that's that's fair. I just and let me really really just give me 30 seconds or less to pull up that roster. Doesn't he fit L.A.? Yes, like, he does. If it was just – if if the whole league is starting from scratch, here's all the players, they're in a pool, and, and all the teams are essentially having a fantasy draft, and you're like, what team's going to want to take Lucic? It's L.A. It's L.A. or Anaheim. Absolutely. And so now a team that's already big and physical and talented up front and has a ton of playoff experience, and he's won a, a Stanley Cup, well, now he's on okay. a team that's won two, and they're big and physical okay, as well. Okay, so here we go. I'm going down the roster. Okay. Six one, six foot. That's the shortest guy. Six right four, six two, six one, six four, six three, six one. Luchik, six three, six three, six one, six one, six one, six one, six three, six one, six one, six four, six three, six. I think you just broke. Did you break? I mean, are you kidding me? The shortest guy on the team is uh, Jonas Enroth, the goalie at five ten. They and he's not going to play anyway. It's it's not just the height either. I mean, that sounds like a basketball team. They're Luch- big. Lucic is 230 These are big pounds. guys. And he's not just like a gentle giant that skates around the ice and doesn't touch anybody. He runs over anything in his way. I mean, he fits perfectly on LA. I think the Kings are going to oh, be Oh, and look who his dangerous. coach is. Yeah. It, it, I hear what you're saying. You're sick of LA getting what they want. They finally had a rough year where they missed the playoffs. And I think that was a one-year thing. And they're definitely going to be back this oh, year. Oh, they'll right? be in the playoffs. Um, three other ones I want to hit on very quickly. Brandon Saad goes from Chicago to Columbus. Like I said, when we get into the uh, – That that to me is just – Chicago was lucky to – Saad I was very surprised because he's young. He's very talented. But there's certain guys that Chicago wanted to keep, been loyal to. Yeah. And it's a money thing. Oh, yeah. we knew it was going to happen. We didn't had know Saad was going to be traded. To. But we knew Chicago was going to look a lot different this yep. year. Um, but I think what he does for Columbus, like especially I said, when 88's not playing, well, yeah, that would make them look quite a bit different. We'll see. But uh, Sod in Columbus, when we do the preview of the Metro, I can just tell you right now, I really like the top of the Metro this year, and I think a good team is going to miss the playoffs. I think Columbus is in. I think that is. Let me let me put it to you this way: I think a lot of things go right, and Edmonton can challenge for a playoff spot. I think if Columbus just stays healthy, they're in. That's the key with Columbus. That's a good team, though. Two seasons in a row, the injury bug bit that team. Badly, especially this I mean, past hard. Year. Most man games in the entire league missed were last year so by Columbus. I agree with that. If Columbus, with the roster they have right now, stays healthy, they're in the playoffs. Two years ago, I remember being on the show talking about how, how Colorado was going to be a real fun team to watch and a dangerous team that could maybe do something. We didn't pick them. This year I'm going to pick the teams actually higher up. But uh, but they went from basically worst to first. And last year, we talked about the Islanders before the season started, and look what they did. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, Columbus is the team this year. that They've got all the right pieces. They've got veteran leadership in the locker room. They've got young goal scorers. They've got a great goalie. Defense is a little thin, but uh, that's a playoff team. No, oh, definitely. And two other trades. TJ Oshie goes to Washington, and he thought about what he – either takes away from St. Louis or brings to the Capitals. Troy Brower goes back to St. Louis in the deal. I don't know why St. Louis lets T.J. Oshie go. It was weird. It... 
St. Louis, I understand that they're frustrated. They've won one playoff series since 2003. But you give one of your best players away? Yeah, I don't, it seems like they were just trying to make trades just for the sake of making trades. Yeah, it didn't make a whole, hey, but they got gotch. <laughs> Good for you. You proud of yourself? You look pretty proud of yourself. And uh, the last one, Carl Hagelin goes to Anaheim from New York. Eh. That was my initial reaction. But he's fast, and Anaheim doesn't really have any fast guys. And you figure they out they used that, to have fast size. Wow, <laughs> you're just in mid-season form in the middle of August. Uh, his his addition, they figure he plays in that second line with Ryan Kessler and Jacob Silverberg, maybe. That's a pretty solid second line. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about a guy that's got 73 games of playoff experience already, which it's not like he's going to come to Anaheim and teach these guys how to play in the playoffs, but they don't have to wait for him. So before this segment wraps up, okay, what does Anaheim have to do to push through? I don't think they have to do anything different than they did last year, except when they hit the crossbar three times in overtime against the uh, the Blackhawks and, and their double and triple overtime games, it's got to be a half inch lower. It's like Mighty Ducks the movie. Half inch lower, and they win the Stanley Cup. I don't doubt it. Thanks, Tips. You're listening to The Hockey Podcast. Feel free to email comments or questions to the show at our email address, thehockeypodcast at gmail.com. Final segment, news and notes, Doug Cannon's favorite segment. I love this segment. We always say it's going to take two minutes. Because it's better than the numbers game. And then we'll be here. Well, that's obviously a fabrication on your part. And we'll be here for another three hours talking about news and notes. Actually, it's actually fabricated truth. Fabricated truth sounds like the name of a band. Ooh, I like it. That's a good name for a band. Yeah, Too bad yeah. neither one of us can play a musical instrument. All right, so news and notes. We just got a couple here this week. Um, the World Legends League. Doug? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And this is uh, – okay, I'm trying to follow I find along it, the story I find here. it interesting. It, it is interesting to me. Is it definitely going to happen? It's supposed to be happening this season in Europe. Okay. And it only involves um, Finland, Sweden, Russia, the Czech, Germany, and Sloka- uh, Slokavia. Slovakia. A new country called Slokavia. Slokavia. Uh, Slovakia. And the guy – Leading the charge on this is Pavel Bure. Why not? The Russian rocket. The Russian rocket. Um, there are plans down the road to include North American cities. So the U.S. and Canada would be. And it's not like a tournament thing. It's a league thing. You have to be, um, I'm trying to think of what the, per- you have to be 45 years and older and have played in the IIHF tournament. So I can't play in this league, but right. now I have something to strive for. And of course, I have to play in the IIHF tournament at some but, point. But I mean, obviously, you know, in North America, I mean, there's a lot of guys that have played in the in the IIHF tournaments, and uh, it'd be kind of fun. I mean, there's going to be names you don't recognize because I mean, those requirements are pretty broad. Yeah, but um, the first, who are the first name when you heard the story? Who's the first name that jumped out to you, other than Burry, because his, his name is attached to the story? Solani. Yeah, exactly. And he just turned 45 last month, so he's eligible. And uh, what's that guy's name, that uh, Swedish guy, uh, Nicholas? Uh, Lidstrom? Yeah, yeah, he was okay, too. So yeah. there, you can just throw him so, in there. So, I mean, it'd be kind of fun. I mean, fans love, like, the old-timer games when they put oh, it yeah. for charity events and stuff yeah. like that. Fans love that. So why not put a little tour together? And, and you're putting... National pride in there too. When you start, when you, and these guys aren't representing a city where they're going to get traded each year or whatever. It, if they do this, it's going to be representing their country. You know, hockey is. I've long marveled at this because it's such a physical game. And if you just look at the the, the four main sports here in, in North America, football and hockey seem like the ones that you're just going to get beat up the most playing. Right. And yet, football. I mean, NFL running back. His career doesn't last past age 27 now, it feels like. But hockey, you can keep playing into your 40s. Yarmer Yager is almost eligible for this league, and he's still playing in the NHL. For whatever reason, you can play hockey into your 40s. If you play adult league, you see guys that are playing in their 50s and aren't bad. I've played with guys in their late 60s. Yeah. I mean, they're not as quick as the 22-year-old on the bench, but they can play. That's the key with this. I mean, it's it's 45 and over. So if you have a guy that's 52, he's not playing against a bunch of 27-year-olds. He's right. just playing, and I would assume there's not going to be much hitting here. I mean, look, this isn't going to rival the NHL or anything, but it's it 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 has my interest if those big names show up. And the I big think names have to show up. I though. think for a league like this, you need 
you need the the berets you need the salonis you, you're going to need that you need a gretzky you, you know what i'm saying you need some name recognition you need like maybe a lemieux right? can you imagine if one of, if one of those guys played although i will say this and you can attest to this as well there are some players that when they're done playing hockey they're done like when their nhl career is done they don't have any interest in even picking up the skates ever again but that's those athletes, and I'm not just talking hockey, but those athletes that retire and can remove themselves from the game, that's a special breed. Because you got to remember, most of these guys that get to the upper level have been playing since they were little five, eight years old, yeah. sometimes 10 or 11. But And your whole routine has been go to the facility, play my sport, come home. Go to the facility, play my sport, come home. And then when you get to the professional level... That's your whole life. I mean, th- that's just day in, day out. It's the routine. And then when you're away from it, man, it's just like, like I've never hit that level, but I, l- I love going to the rink. I love going to the rink, and I would, I know I would miss it. Well, and they all talk about, or not all of them, but a lot of players when they retire talk about how, yeah, they miss playing and they miss the routine. They also just miss constantly hanging out with a group of with 20 the of their boys, friends. With the guys. Yeah. yeah. And I just think back to like, like think back to college, like your freshman, at least for me, our freshman year of college, everybody lived in the same dorm. It was a, there was a huge courtyard. I mean, you were just constantly, something was always going on. And even the the switch from freshman year when you're on campus to sophomore year when you're off campus here, even that was a bit of a switch. But think about like when you, when everybody graduates and goes in their separate directions, like think about how, just socially how tough that can be. Imagine that on, on this level where, oh, by the way, we're also paying you millions of dollars to hang out with your friends. Well, I mean, you know, I talked about that Hall of Fame in, uh, ceremony that I was a, a part of is that the one thing the kids kept saying over and over again is that he would go, yeah, and all the guys I played with, I still text, I still talk to, yeah. even though we're not playing together anymore. I mean, that bond uh, is so strong. And I mean, I mean, especially, you know, you hear players talk about it all the time that it's nothing against their families or anything, but sometimes they need to get on the road and be with the guys to bond with the guys yeah. and, and to get that, uh, that fabric woven really tight. Especially in hockey. And it's, again, it's not to rip the other sports, but baseball, there's a lot of individual parts. So yeah, you've got you've got some friends on the team, and I'm sure it's just as hard in baseball when you retire to, mm-hmm. to not be able to hang out in the clubhouse or whatever. But you know, baseball, a lot of it's individualized. Football, the rosters are just so big that it's not like you know everybody on the team. It's a 53 man roster. You hang out generally with if you're a wide receiver, you hang out with the other wide receivers, or if you're a right. defensive back. But hockey's like that that right size where it's 20, 22, 23 players. Everybody knows each other. The locker room's not that big. You have to be on the same page with everybody on the ice for it to work. Right. So hockey and, and I would say basketball too. I mean, it's the same sort of thing. Those are the two where I think it's it's that much more conducive where you have to get along with your and teammates. And the one thing I see with hockey is that um, because you and I both covered the game is that when you're in the hallway and there's team A and there's team B and player X had been traded to team B, they still go down to the other locker room to talk to the guys that they used to play with. Every game. Every game. They, yeah. they don't get on the bus. They don't just shower. Oh, well, we lost. I get on a shower. I'm going to go to the bus. I'm going to go to the next city. No. They, they shower, and they go, and they find their buddy that they used to play with on their former team. I, I see it with uh, with my boys. They There's so many associations that the guys they've played against, and they see them down the road, or, or we'll see them out of town in a tournament, and they stop in the hallway, and they talk, and, and they they even have a friendship. I mean, it's a yeah. really, really insensuous community. It's really tight. Yeah, that's good. And that's why I, I do think – I mean, look, we're going to have to see what the caliber of play here is. If it just ends up looking like the All-Star game where the scores are 17 to 15 or whatever, then I don't know how – how long this would last, but if this ends up being like a real competitive, you know, think of your local rink, the highest level of adult league hockey there is usually guys that either used to play minor league or college. professional or college. Yeah. There's some, you know, if the games are all six, four or whatever. I could see people at least checking this out. I mean, the hardcore hockey fans are going to take a look again. The big names have to be there. Otherwise it's just going to, yeah, they're not going to sell tickets. All right. So the one other thing I want to hit here, the, and this is right up your alley, the sort of, merging of the NHL with MLBAM, which is fun to say if you just say MLBAM. But those two forces kind of coming together. Well, I mean, the, the NHL's digital content uh, 
was done with a company by the name of New Lion. Now they're going to do it with MLB BAM or ML BAM. Um, so people within the industry, especially the broadcast industry, know that Major League Baseball was one of the first professional sports that really grabbed the bull by the horns on handling digital content. And they started with the web. Then they started streaming games on the web. And then yeah. they started streaming games on your phone. Um, but they found the right recipe for advertising and to make it work in a solid platform. Well, the NHL sat down with those people and said, let's get together. And so now the NHL content is not on MLB.com, folks. Don't worry. Yeah. It'll be on NHL.com. It's just that we're using their technology to distribute the content to the world. So the streaming content on the web, streaming content on your favorite tablet or whatever is going to be controlled. And the network um, cable show, the NHL network, will fold underneath this umbrella as well. So basically upgrades may be pretty much across the board. Yes. And maybe some you won't even necessarily notice at first, but it just seems like... It definitely seems like a good thing for the NHL fan. I think it's a great thing for the NHL fan, and you know you'll, you'll see changes with the websites and and all anything digital is going to come under this umbrella, and which is everything right now. And well, that's the world, right? Yeah, that's the world we live in, and it it's a very complicated thing when they sit down and they have to do a, a broadcast deal with a broadcast company because it's like, well, who owns the digital content? Well, most broadcast companies have their own website, so why can't I stream the content on my website? Well, because the content belongs to the NHL. So it's those little nuances that, that get are, ironed out. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm looking forward to seeing that this year, too, and the theme I've said numerous times throughout the show. Oh, and the other thing is it's a huge revenue drev- uh, generator for the league. So well, that there, seems like a good thing. There's a huge financial reward on this as well. Which you factor in, they just got that, that pretty big TV deal a couple of years ago, too. Now, the NHL is uh, doing very well for itself. I think Mr. Bettman, with all his naysayers, is doing a fine job of running the league. I think it's impossible to be a commissioner of a sport and not have a lot of naysayers. Well, there's just, well, you're the, it's anything in life. When something goes wrong, it's always the guy at the top that gets blamed. It's your fault. Which is usually what you're getting paid for is to take the blame. It's, yeah, you're going to take the heat. That doesn't mean he was at fault, but he's going to take the heat. Doug, this was fun. This was great. We should do this more. Me? We should do this more than once. Time's your game tonight. Three months. It's in like two hours. I got lots of time. Yeah, I might even eat lunch. <laughs> That's it for episode 57. Join us next time as we begin previewing the 2015-16 campaign with a look at some of the big names that are entering their contract year. We will also take a look at the prospects entering or we think we'll be entering the NHL this upcoming season. Plus, whatever else lands on the hockey radar, thanks for listening to the Hockey Podcast.